my pleasure today to introduce Craig. Uh, Craig is a developer uh, for PostgreSQL and he has a special interest in meeting the needs of the real world user. So thank you, Craig. Thank you. It's quite odd actually because I got into PostgreSQL looking at usability issues and the, the really common use case that everyone faces. And now here I am writing distributed multi-master systems for niche areas and half, spending half my time arguing with people about why they shouldn't use them. So it's been a very strange journey. But I'm Craig Ringer. I work for Second Quadrant. Um, we do pretty much everything PostgreSQL at the company. And I will try not to talk about the commercial side as much as I can. I stay involved in Stack Overflow. You can find me there. I'm a reluctant Twitter user, etc. But um, yeah, please, folks, if you see usability issues in Postgres, I'm really interested. I don't think the core community pays, pays enough interest, and I'd really like to hear from you. So that's my little personal interest aside. Now, talk proper. Um, company I work for. Here I said I just wouldn't talk about them too much, and here they are. But uh, that's life. They paid for me to fly here. Um, lots of PostgreSQL sponsorship, lots of development work, be involved in all of replication all of the replication features and so on, and a lot of the core project has been built with and through the team I work with. So essentially um, supporting that outfit helps pay for Postgres, or parts of it. I can't certainly can't claim all of it. So talk proper, multi-master. We're here for multi-master. Now, I know the talk title is partly about BDR, the specific multi-master flavor I work with, but I'm actually mostly here to talk to you about multi-master and distributed systems in general, and the, the way that there isn't just one. There is not one pure multi-master. There's actually lots of different ones. And people say, we need multi-master. Management says, we need multi-master. This guy over here told us we need multi-master. It will solve all of our HA problems. Everything will be magic. We'll scale better. We need it. Get us multi-master. And it's just not that simple, because it's like apples and oranges, except even more absurd. Um, there are really discrete sets of different multi-master systems with different trade-offs and different compromises. And it's not just implementation detail. It's fundamental, and as I'll get to later, it's physics. Um, so quick review of traditional high availability in PostgreSQL and other sort of block-based database systems. Here's a typical Postgres deployment. You have one master, multiple standbys. They're read standbys. They're probably streaming at a block level with Postgres's block replication protocol. But this is just an example. You could be using DRBD or whatever. Uh, on a failure, the usual, one, one fails. So you terminate it. You promote a replica. And life goes on. You repoint the clients. There's no drama. This is probably old hat to most of the audience here. There are other ways. Many SAN vendors will tell you that replication of those models are very silly and they're a waste. And what you should do is buy their large expensive SAN, which will never, ever, ever fail. And you should use a shared storage model. Now, I don't have to tell you why you shouldn't use that because Postgres doesn't support it. So, but yeah, needless to say, there are problems. No, that said, it has its uses. And all of these models, even the weird ones, have the uses. So, You've been running a traditional replication setup. It's all going pretty well. You've had a bit of trouble with the tools, but you got there. Then someone says, we're starting a Singapore office. This is fun. So you create a clone, your replica over there. Everything gets up and running. You're happy. And then the Singapore client starts saying, this is really slow. All my apps are really slow. Everything I do is slow. It's painful. And when I save changes, sometimes when I load them again, they disappear, and then they reappear again a little while later, and it's just make this stop. So what's happening is that the, oops, jumping ahead of myself. What's happening here is that the clients in Singapore must, they can read from the local one if you're doing some kind of read load balancing, but they can, must write via the master in Sydney. And you've probably got several hundred milliseconds latency in network alone or between those two. Lots of database systems will be doing many round trips for a simple write. You could have f seconds between these two. And in terms of the human perception, I'm sure you're probably familiar with the idea that above about 200 milliseconds, people start noticing. And about 500 to a, a second, they start getting frustrated. And after about five seconds, they go and get coffee. So 
you're facing frustrated users, productivity losses, etc. And someone says, why aren't we doing multi-master? Especially once this happens one day. Your, master off your main office goes down, you're just like, we planned for this, this is great. We'll fail the Sydney clients over to the Singapore office, there's no dramas. Sure, Sydney's slow, but we're up, we've retained our connectivity. At least assuming the WAN isn't what failed, which it does. So traditional model, again, multi-site failover, disaster recovery, you stay up. We talked about that, slow, slow reads, slow writes. I've got ahead of myself. If your WAN fails, then your secondary site is completely out of luck. They can read, they can't write. They're probably not very happy, but hopefully you've done your business continuity planning and you're ready for this. You know that this will fail. You know that you can go read only, you can cope. But Management will inevitably say that's not good enough. We must stay up and available for all of the nodes. Well, you can do that, but this isn't how. This happens quite routinely. One of my fun little things that I get to do periodically is to clean up after this. Someone promoted the replica. It's usually a script. Someone wrote a script that auto-promotes when things break so they don't have to deal with pager call in the middle of the night. Now, I hate automatic promotion. Please don't use automatic promotion unless you test it in production, okay? Because what will happen is your system will auto-promote and it's never done it before and it will break. And then they'll page you and it's worse. Like this, you'll get told, well, Sydney's saving stuff and it's appearing in Sydney but not Singapore and vice versa. What do we do now? Okay. Now, there's pretty much no really good automated tools to clean up after this data divergence. You get to keep the pieces and clean them up. Um, <laughs> be prepared for a pretty sad couple of weeks. Most of us want to avoid that. And in the end, what it comes down to is any automation system is inherently flawed because to safely promote after a failed replica, you must ensure that the old replica is gone. Like, sorry, the old master. The old master is gone. It is absolutely non-functional. It's fenced off. The term fencing just means isolate it, so it's probably still there but you've pulled the network, you've removed its VLAN access, you've done something that makes it inaccessible. And the other term that's often used is stoneth, or shoot the other node in the head, which is pull the plug, physically destroy the server with a chainsaw, you know, make sure it never comes back. But you cannot do these things in an automated way because your communication channel is gone. Um, so lots of solutions exist. You might be using a sideband, Telephone them and say, make sure the plug is pulled and you just hope the satellite's working. You might have a slower sideband that you can use autom automation over, such as a, an expensive satellite link you can't run your database over, but you can run control a, a control channel over, that sort of thing. But you can use a sideband, possibly. Some people use DNS-based systems. They're a terrible idea for relational databases. They're great for some stuff. But because relational databases have strong ideas about data integrity and things, you, you tend to create a split plane situation in another way where some changes are routed to one server, some to another, and things get exciting. So I don't recommend that for traditional database deployments. And again, the simplest solution is accept that you have that point of failure, use a proxy, and if things go down, they go down. Um, and a surprisingly sensible one, in my opinion, is to Accept and plan for the divergence. Have a cleanup process. Have a part of your business continuity plan, part of your disaster recovery that you test is to allow divergence to happen and fix it later. You've got tools, you've got plans. Part of that is because you cannot prevent that divergence completely even in a single master system. People may not realize this, but here, what we see is that two transactions have been done on the master. The second one, TX2, occurs after network failure. So where does it go? It was on the old master. It's not on the new one. It's gone into the void, ether. So it's a form of divergence where the old timeline ends and the new one begins. There's no duplication, but the committed changes still got lost. If other systems are aware of those commits, then you've got inconsistency with other systems, etc. So you always have to allow for some data loss and divergence. Someone comes along, we've been talking about this, they've probably been nagging you since we started this talk about why you should use multi-master. 
look, we just route transaction two to the second master while it comes back up. We'll route the transactions from the promoted master back to the old one. They can both be masters, they can play together, we'll merge everything, it's magic. It's wonderful. So, and it really is. For some things, don't get me wrong, a multi-master system can be really wonderful. Um, you've got no local write latencies for your clients, everything's fast, you get, everyone stays up, it's just perfectly available, there's none of this failover, a fencing mess that you're dealing with, you're not worrying about plug pulls and all of that. It's absolutely brilliant. And there are situations for which that's true. There are simple little data collection applications and things where that is exactly what you want. But the vendors got into it, and the vendors said, this is perfect for everything. You should use it, really. They probably went to your management, and they said you should use it. But it's not that easy. Not with relational databases, not with most things that aren't a very simple insert-only log of changes, because while you're isolated, you might make changes that could not occur in a single node database system. Now, there is no way to prevent this while we're isolated because we cannot talk to each other. We can't exchange locks, we can't do row locks, we can't do any of this. So if we're remaining available, if we are continuing to accept and commit transactions, both of these nodes must commit these changes. So what do we do when the network comes back? What's the answer? There are two correct answers to a single query that can only have one answer. Assuming that there's a unique constraint, which I didn't make clear. There is a unique constraint here. Um, lots of other issues that are related to that. Lots of people use synthetic keys. Well, if you're using synthetic keys, they're usually using a counter. And if you can't increment the counter because your link's gone, or it's slow, or whatever, you're in trouble. You have issues where writes become visible on one node and not another and then you make calculations based on them, <coughs> things get exciting. But at a more fundamental level, you're facing the problem that your application was written possibly <coughs> some time ago because as a number of these talks have mentioned, nobody has green fields, especially if you're using an RDBMS, you are working with existing applications. These applications authors may have even read the manual, they may have read some of the spec. They have come to rely on things like row locking working. They have come to rely on things like data that's committed being visible after you commit it, not vanishing. And if you are doing a simple load balancing between multiple nodes, these assumptions may cease to be true. Certainly, they inherently have to cease to be true if those nodes can't talk to each other anymore. So your app, you're, you're breaking fundamental assumptions your application's authors have made. You're pointing them at a new system that has the same interfaces, the same queries, etc., that the app is used to. So you won't get any errors, not up front. But you're changing the rules underneath them. You're changing what the words they're saying mean, but understanding each word individually as the same thing. So great caution is required. You can leap in, and it all seems to work really wonderfully at first and then you have your first network outage or fault or whatever and things go really, really, really messy. So, the fundamental point, if you go home with one thing today, there's more than one kind of multi-master. Well, okay, one thing, more than one thing. The key points I want you to go home with today, there are more, there's more than, more than one kind of multi-master and all of them involve trade-offs, as do single master systems. Multi-master is not always the right answer, it can be brilliant, you need to do requirements analysis for your applications, your tools, your needs, including your legacy concerns, and determine which tool is right for you. And a really useful trick I've learned with this is making salespeople say no, turning questions backwards. Make them say no. If they say, yes, it absolutely will lose all my data when you crash, yes, it will lose all your data when you crash, Oh, wait, you can't, you're filtering the yes men. My point here is there's a lot of really dodgy sales data out there on a lot of products that glosses over a lot of the details. You need to dig into the specifics, you need to test it. So, I've said there's more than one kind of multi-master. I'd like to get into that. I use 
They're not my invention, but I find it a really useful form. I use two categories of multi-master to broadly describe things to people based on strength of coupling, loosely coupled and tightly coupled models of multi-master. Now, that tends to come along with the loosely coupled model tends to be generally shared storage or tightly replicated. It tends to be, sorry, I, my apologies, I got that backwards. The tightly coupled model tends to often tends to have shared storage or replication with lots of coordination. You've got a lot of internode chatter. You have, generally you have conflict prevention. You have a highly consistent model where the application gets to pretend that it's talking to one database, one instance, one node, and all of the multi-node, multi-master stuff is largely concealed. Now, this is a spectrum. It's not two discrete things. So you've got a lot of things that are in various positions along the spectrum, but in general, tightly coupled systems try to look like a single node. Certain big vendors, big names, you may know them. Um, loosely coupled systems, quite the opposite. We go for we uh, go for more of an optimistic conflict resolution after it occurs. Setup tends to be exclusively replicated because you can't rely on being able to access the same storage, and if you can, it's slow. We are uh, like such systems will be tend to re. Okay, you'll know the term eventual consistency. Pretty popular, it was really big in the 2000 era. Well, the name may have faded, but that's pretty much what a lot of loosely coupled systems are. You're doing eventual consistency, lazy conflict resolution, replication, etc. It's all great, but as I'm sure a lot of people who've worked with tools like Cassandra and the other ones that became popular early on learned, app changes are pretty much unavoidable. So. On the left, we have a common major vendor's application cluster model, approximated. So lots of chatter, nodes talk to each other, they agree before I'm gonna commit this, yes, you can, you can commit this, um, I'm acquiring this transaction ID, I want this block of IDs, lots and lots of chatter. They perform well on low latency networks that are reliable, they have Facilities in place for removing, adding nodes, failed nodes, etc. But they like to have well-defined states. This node is alive or dead. It's not. I don't know. Um, you can also do tightly coupled systems with replication. The set, the right one, the right one there is actually somewhat similar to how Postgres XL works. Uh, but there's numerous other tools. The point is that it's a replicated system, but you have manager nodes that provides single, point, single points of truth, possibly coordinated with HA, to say, again, this transaction is committed, this one is not. They provide a globally consistent view of what's committed, what's locked, what's visible, to allow the app to pretend it's talking to a single system, by and large. It's really nice, but it doesn't work so great when you start distributing it geographically to face wider availability needs to serve users who are separated by latency and unreliable networks, et cetera. It's generally limited to data center level availability because they just don't work with high latency networks. You can't exchange 400 round trips for each transaction. Which is why we have loosely coupled systems like, and of which BDR is one of many examples. Many of you will know Galleria. That is yet another. Um, it takes. It has different trade-offs, but it's also largely a loosely coupled system. Peer nodes. There's generally no single master or coordinator. Rather, they're generally equal peers. They replicate changes to each other. They don't do a lot of work saying, "I'm about to change this." Yes, you may change this. No, you may not. Etc. What they do is they say, "I ran this transaction. Apply the changes." It tends to be replication rather than clustering. So lots less overhead, lots less chatter, but there's a reason all of that chatter and overhead exists. When we get rid of it, we are throwing away a lot of the guarantees that are made by those tightly coupled and single node systems about how the system behaves. I've got myself slightly out of order here, so yeah. yeah. You know the term ACID? Okay. 
hands. Anyone, is, is anyone not familiar with the term acid in databases? It's fine, I wasn't a while ago. Oh, okay, we're good, um, or shy. Uh, acid, yeah, so it's, a, it's a common set of assumptions that's promised by most or all relational database products. And physics, as I'll get to shortly, says you can't have that in a distributed multi-master system that is designed to be fault tolerant. Everyone wants both. Most marketing departments promise both. Um, of course you can have perfect real-time consistency across your five millisecond link to the moon. Sorry, 500 millisecond link to the moon. That would be very nice. Um, that's no problem. Yes, 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 we can do that. Yes, now sign. Um, physics says no. So if they're promising that, they, they're not usually lying. What they're usually doing is weaseling a little bit because many products have two or more different operational modes and what they're saying is that in mode one it can do this and in mode two it can do this. Therefore, the product as a whole absolutely can do these things. It just can't do them at the same time. Um, so time, light speed. We can't go faster than light and life happens. Real world networks are messy. They get cut, things break. So if your vendor promises you an immediately consistent, globally distributed, multi-master, real-time system that is application transparent, they have one of these. And there's a really well-established body of theory to justify that. Many of you will have heard of the CAP theorem. Um, it's actually a bit oversimplified and it's commonly misused to talk about databases, but I'll mention it because it's a good entry point, it's familiar. The idea is you can have something that's consistent, something that tolerates network outages and partitions, and something that's highly available and you know deals with nodes breaking and things, but you can't have all three, you can only have two of them at a time. Pick. The truth is that the definitions of partition tolerance, availability, and consistency used, consistency used by CAP, CAP are not the same as those that you think they are because it's actually a really simplified abstract model, which is why we have the PAC-ELC model, or PAC-ELC. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read that to you. You can look at it. It's on the slides. The point is, if it's up, it's fast or consistent. You can't have both. When it's online, it must be... It can either be really responsive or guarantee consistency because light speed says you can't chatter between distant nodes. And when it's down, when the networks are isolated, it can promise consistency or it can limit availability by bringing down all but one of the partitions, all of the, the, the zones. You can't have both because you can't agree on what you're changing. BDR, which is you know, what I'm here to talk about in a sense, is a loosely coupled system. So we chose partition tolerance and latency tolerance and we sacrificed consistency. So we're talking more Cassandra than RAC here. Um, it's not a tightly coupled system. What this means is I spend a lot of my time arguing with people about why they shouldn't use it. Um, now, that said, I think it's great. I think loosely coupled systems are great, but you must understand them. You can't point your 1985 application with that was written for in-person terminals and one-to-one -one user to database connections at this stuff. You can't point it at a load balancer and just figure it'll work. You have to accept that changes are needed. You need to deal with uniqueness of keys. You need to deal with what happens when changes are made in isolation that conflict and how you need to make decisions about how your application and system respond to that. Those are application-specific things. They are not something that the system can just magically do for you because, okay, as a simple example, if node one sets a row to value four and node two sets it to seven, we don't know if one of those nodes added one or if it set it to four. We don't know the old value. We don't know 
uh, we don't know if the new merged row should be the sum of two additions or if it should be the newer value that was set. We can't know that because it's application specific. We don't know if it's a counter or if it's a flags field or what. There is just not the information there. Um, there is some theory around doing that in select cases, but it's out of scope. So I've basically told you it's hard. And I think it's great, but it's really hard and that I argue with people not to use it. So how do you use it if you actually want to? If these benefits, if the advantages to the geographic distribution, et cetera, are worth it for you, if your application needs to stay up in remote locations, if you can't tolerate being read-only, if you need this stuff and you're willing to do the work. Okay, first. My favorite phrase, but we can't change the application. If this is you, if this is your people, if this is your team, then I'm sorry, I, I just can't help you. Um, I have actually dealt with people who promise that they can make the application changes we talk about. They promise that they can switch to a different key generation model. And when I actually come to them and we come to try and deploy, they say, oh, no, we can't change the application as third party vendor. It's, it's like they weren't listening to anything. So. Change, because it doesn't follow the full ACID model, you cannot just point the existing app, okay? Can't change the app, can't do it. If you can change the app, then you can come up with solutions for things like key generation issues. Molt knows generate keys, they replicate them. Everyone's happy because they have unique keys, but we need to make sure that they all have unique keys without talking to each other, because they can't promise to talk to each other. Lots of different methods for doing that. We can use some side channel that's hopefully very highly available and outside the normal database replication channel. Check numbers, things that are really business critical. You might do it with that. You might accept that that means that you lose some availability there. Common solution is instead use discrete counters, step and offset. You just different, you partition the number space. You can use a natural key. Please don't, but you can use a natural key. Um, or rather, okay, names are not keys. Just repeat that to yourself over and over and over again. Names are not keys. They have none of the characteristics of keys. If you have not read the article, things programmers should know about names, please read it. Okay? And government IDs are keys until the government changes the ID scheme. So, yeah, natural keys. They seem great. People love them. Don't. Um, and the system we used in BDR1 was to communicate between the nodes in a failure tolerant way to agree on ID block allocations or do something weak and chattery. Works pretty well so long as your nodes aren't out for too long, etc. This is pretty fashionable at the moment. Use really, really big random numbers and it works pretty well. It's actually really unpleasant for B tree indexes because your inserts go all over the place, you land up with more page splits. Your scans aren't time ordered, etc. So there are trade-offs, it's not magic, but it's a choice. And like all of this, you have to do your requirements analysis. You have to make these choices. The vendor, the tool, cannot make them for you because they depend on the application. We know this. Okay, another one, timestamps. We can use a bit, a bit range in our IDs. Part of it's a timestamp, part of it's a node ID part of it's a local counter. It's semi-time ordered, so it's kind of friendly, but you tend to run into the problem that 64 bits just isn't enough. And you will either have a deadline where you just run out of IDs because your timestamps hit the limit, or you don't have enough node counters or whatever. But that's actually one of the models that BDR offers and prefers, and we just accept the deadline as life. We'll go to 128 bit if it happens. Um, I've talked about conflicts. What are conflicts? I've talked about it. Okay. Conflicting inserts. But BDR, BDR's answer to that is last update wins most of the time. We don't know what the app really wants. We guess, we can't guess what the app really wants. And so we figure, eh, we'll pick the newest. If the app doesn't like it, we, in BDR, we offer some limited user-defined conflict handlers, but they are extremely limited. And the truth is most of the time what you should be doing is designing and tweaking the app so that the last update wins model is the correct outcome. And it will really surprise 
the, in BDR, but this is, most systems suffer from this sort of thing, can give your application developers surprises. The conflicts aren't just we inserted two things in two different places. Conflicts can be I inserted this row that some other node has deleted, but some third node hasn't replayed the delete yet, so it sees two inserts and picks the, yep. There are non-trivial forms of conflict. There are three node plus only forms of conflicts. I can't go into all of it because there's a hell of a lot, but that's why we have documentation. Um, but the one that I do want to highlight is foreign keys. We delete a, a node graph and, an, and sorry, an entity graph, and at the same time, another node adds a child. There is no correct solution to that when both of those are committed. If you resurrect the parent, you violated one node's promises about the committed transaction. If you remove the parent, you violated the other node's promises. There is no one correct solution. Foreign keys are not compatible with completely distributed systems if those systems are both changing the same set of related objects. So again, we come to application design. You can accept it, drop the foreign key. Sorry, I know, I sound like someone is working on MySQL 3.3, but it's, it's physics, it's not me. Um, sometimes you just can't have it. Or tweak your app so that it makes consistent changes to entire object graphs. If necessary, delete and recreate the graph. It's a bit awkward. I want to add some better tooling for that. I want to add some better conflict handlers for that. But fundamentally, what it comes down to is we'll violate your assumptions, check your apps. All right. So check your apps. We have, we have tools. There's lat you can simulate latency. You can run VMs that get killed randomly. You can start and stop stuff. You can introduce delays, packet loss, etc. You should do all of this. Simulate the real world conditions. But you can also tweak how your application works. You can try and improve data locality so that all of your accesses to some sets of data are strictly defined to only be on one node. And if you fail over and suddenly it's not all on one node, you just deal with the conflicts. You plan for that. You may have a manual resolution set up again. But yeah. App tweaks, design tweaks, and testing. Not enough testing. All right, I'm, I've kind of meandered a little bit and run low on time, so I'll just quickly get to the point that beyond write conflicts, there are other changes that aren't necessarily as obvious, like here, one node makes some changes, another node makes some changes, both of them do a sum. And the answer to that sum is not an outcome that could occur if both transactions were run on a single node because of the delay in replication and replicating the changes. This isn't too bad normally, but if you then use that sum to write to another row, you'll propagate that into your system. And that stale data can propagate through the system. So if any of you are familiar with Postgres snapshot isolation, it tries to prevent this sort of thing on a single node, but comes down to is you can't have the same semantics. I'm repeating that, I'm repeating that for a reason. You can't have single node semantics. Another example, we don't replicate lock states. You lock a row, sorry, it's only locked on the node that you ran the locking on, not the others. So if you're doing things like gapless counter, seek gapless counter generation used for check numbers, etc., you'll get duplicates, sorry, and it's silent. You'll get conflict reports in the logs in BDR, but it depends on the system you're using. Others will behave differently. Again, you might think you can fix this with internode chatter and stuff, but if the network goes down and you want to stay up, pick one. BDR-specific tweet tip, but if you're using it, um, any relational system that's making a schema change may create a situation where the rows are not, that where rows that are committed on remote nodes in an asynchronous replication setup no longer makes sense on other nodes that have made a schema change. You might add a new column that must be non-null, but you have committed but not replicated rows on other nodes where that value is not, or similar. 
There are some tweaks we can make on that, but fundamentally what it comes down to is you have to flush all the replication queues, stop the world, synchronize everything up, and then make the schema change on all the nodes, and then get back to normal. So it's a special case of having to go temporarily synchronous. So I think that's most of my application specific tweaks. So I'd just like to get onto the testing side. That is, you've tested your app. Sure, you tested it, it's brilliant. Look, you just pointed at three BDR nodes in your lab, it's running great. You didn't have to change anything. Your users are happy and you're planning on going into production next week. Don't, because your lab's network is fast, it's reliable, it doesn't drop packets, the nodes don't die. Um, the load probably doesn't reflect the real world load. You won't get the concurrency that, where you actually see the problems that come from distributed asynchronous multi-master systems. Real world testing is really important. Try and get as close to the actual conditions your production system will be in before you go live. You can't just go completely in production. You can't ask 100 million users or whatever you're using, hey, test my beta. So what you'll do is compromises. You'll have a set of graded test environments. At minimum, you should have something that does latency simulation, randomly kills nodes, packet loss, packet duplication, bit of craziness. Um, it's not perfect. Someone will always come up with a better idiot, is the phrase I've heard, but you can't test for everything. The world is crazy, but what you can do is test for as much as you can and add new tests and new conditions when you discover new crazy. So I love Chaos Monkey and that principle, not necessarily that tool, but that principle. This is why I was less than thrilled with automated failover at the start because people use it, but they don't test it. Automated failover is fine, single master or multi-master, if you test it in production all the time. But if you don't, it will make an existing outage worse. This is massively more true with a distributed async system like this because latency is all over the place. Um, a network fails in a way where it passes packets in one direction but not the other because they're being routed through Russia. Um, you, there is a lot of craziness out there. And yeah, the more, cra more of that craziness you can creatively simulate, the fewer 4 a.m. pager calls you'll get. So loosely coupled systems, they're not effort free. It's not magic. No multi-master is magic. No multi-master is compromise free. And for a lot of users, the right solution is a single master deployment with failover, and stoneth and fencing. Or maybe a tightly coupled system or a hybrid. You might have tightly coupled systems in different regions and replication between them. You have lots of choices. The only choice you don't have is magic, teleporting, wormhole, whiz bang that your vendor is trying to sell you where it's all consistent and HA all at the same time. When your management comes to you and tells you that, you need to push back, push for testing, don't go into production this week, yes, we know you promised, yes, you'll pay SLA penalties, they'll be worse if we fail, okay, test, push back, accept the benefits, work with the benefits, you've got happy users, fast databases, everything's close, the latency is low, the network goes down and they can all still work and so on. It's wonderful. I work with a film studio that does this and it's just brilliant because they, they can't, they lose millions an hour if their users in one studio can't work because the database in the other studio is down and they can't just resynchronize. It's impossible for their work, their work, but they've planned for the problems. They have a recovery plan for short term outages. They have, a plan for what happens if it's out for too long, they're ready. You need to be ready if you're going to use it and push back against the, the hype. So yeah, at the risk of going 290s for you, add more nines of availability if you do it right. But 
accept the effort, accept the planning. Don't just throw your apps at it, please. I don't want more work in urgent support. Um, so, questions? Anyone? Have I repeated myself and confused you too much, or are we relatively okay? No, Mike. Okay. Um, in the event that you don't have uh, uh, geographically uh, geographical dis distance between the multi masters, can you use them uh, with, say, something like Keep Alive D uh, moving a bit between the two masters? So you're always just talking to one of them, and the other is replicating. Does that work with this uh, BDR system? Okay, short version there, like to summarize, if the masters aren't geographically distributed and you assume the network between them is reliable, yeah. can you use something like Keep Alive to ping between them, choose one as the right master at the time and have the other as a passive node that is a master candidate you fail over to at any time? Yes. Lots of people want it. Yes, you can, but you are not free from those conflict problems because at that time of failover, there can be, no, there can be changes committed on the old master but not replicated to the new one. You start pointing rights at the new one, and now, pop, they replicate from the old master, either you might, depending on why you failed over, if the old master was deemed too slow and you failed over, then they might replicate soon. They might replicate in two weeks when the power comes back on in the generator room, we don't know. But at some point, if there are committed but not replicated changes, you'll face a conflict. What happens in a single master setup instead is that you've changed to a new timeline, those, those changes are gone absolutely forever. So it's probably better to have conflicts than to throw them away, but you have to plan for it. It means that your app must be able to cope. So yes, you can do it, but it doesn't make the problems go away. It's just a different set of compromises. Anyone? Yep. Okay, can triggers suffer from similar problems regarding visibility and consistency? Yes, they can. The example I gave was some, for example, you might ensure, you might be trying to assert that there can be only four child rows for this parent. Your triggers on both nodes check this when they do independent inserts. Both of them locked the parent row, as they should, to ensure that concurrency locally is maintained correctly, but those locks don't propagate. So, when the two nodes reconcile their changes, they flush their committed buffers, you have five children, because both nodes added a child and they overlapped the limit. So yes, triggers used for consistency and integrity suffer from exactly the same sorts of issues based due to the, the fact that we don't replicate locking and we don't replicate changes until commit. And that's also true, by the way, on related systems like Galleria, um, which is a slightly different compromise, but largely a loosely coupled async system. What they do is they replicate a change after commit, and they look for conflicts, and by default, actually, I don't, I don't know if it's by default, but they can bounce that change back, and they can say, okay, don't commit it on the origin node, because it conflicts with another node. That is by default, yes. Pardon? That is by default. That is the default? Okay, great. I was afraid I was speaking out of my, because um, I don't. But that won't, that doesn't encode knowledge about which rows you read. It doesn't, it can't know what did that trigger check. So it protects against some sorts of anomalies, not others. It's also bad with latency, the more latency you get, the requires Yeah, latency and node, and it's partition tolerance. It's CAP, pack elk. It's a different, different set of compromises. One more question? Anyone? I have successfully confused the audience. Uh, Thank you. Yes, let's, let's thank Craig.